Good day, everyone. Uh, welcome to our, our webinar today, our Social Innovation Summit Salon. My name is Mel Ochoa. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Landmark Ventures. And Landmark Ventures produces the Social Innovation Summit, which happens every June. This year it's gonna happen from June 2nd through 4th, and it's 100% virtual, which is quite exciting for us. Uh, it's gonna be the biggest summit yet. We have great speakers, attendees still coming in, uh, and it's going to have the reach that we've never had before, now that it's virtual. Uh, we also have some upcoming webinars, uh, particularly a Future of Work webinar coming up, and you can learn more at uh, socinnovation.com. Uh, I also want to thank all of our Social Innovation Summit partners uh, for all of their support and friendship, uh, especially PwC and Lyft for joining us today as featured speakers. Uh, it's great to have so much support as we build up to the Social Innovation Summit, so thank you. Today we are taking a different approach uh, versus some of the other webinars that we've had in the past few weeks. Uh, we are looking at a salon format today and really what that uh, looks like is a reflection of our main stage session at the Social Innovation Summit, where in the matter of 60 or so minutes, we have a few different uh, formats or segment types, uh, a few fireside chats, a few panels, uh, a TED-like talk with, um, with a speaker, uh, Mike Masterman from Lyft. And so we wanted to uh, bring that uh, main stage session to you online to give you a little taste of what to expect at the Social Innovation Summit on June 2nd and 4th. Uh, so our theme today is mobilizing action in response to COVID-19. Uh, I just read a, a Bloomberg piece that seems like a lot of tech firms but other organizations definitely are looking at, at or feeling a higher purpose right now. Uh, it doesn't seem like it's uh, all about the bottom line right now. Uh, organizations are prioritizing action over business as usual, if you will. Uh, I know even IDEO out in San Francisco has a business, business pivot challenge right now in which you could uh, earn $10,000 based on your solutions and how you've pivoted in this, in this response. Uh, so uh, we wanna approach the conversation today uh, looking at some of those responses, how organizations have pivoted, but particularly around uh, the lens of underlying inequalities that have been surfaced. Uh, we, have, we have seen the disparities more than we've ever had before, so we wanna talk about those today as well. Um, this is a recurring topic in many conversations recently, how people are responding to COVID-19, but we wanted to take a different approach and pull in uh, a cross-section of leaders and experts. So today we have with us uh, Jeff from PwC, uh, so we wanted to take that business services provider angle. Uh, we have Mike from Lyft, uh, so that transportation aspect. Uh, Amanda from uh, the city of Los Angeles, so the government perspective. Uh, Jamal from Common Spirit, uh, bringing in that healthcare voice. Uh, Michael from Glide, uh, a community-based organization uh, perspective. And then Emily from Facebook to bring that uh, tech platform, platform voice. Two more things that I'll mention before we uh, dig into it. All attendees received a digital brochure. In it, you will see bios for all of our speakers as well as the agenda. Uh, you also have links to all the speakers' LinkedIn information. So use that to reach out to, to speakers and learn more about them. And then right after this session at three o'clock Eastern time, uh, we have a, an online one-on-one -on -one networking function that we're going to launch. Uh, so you can see instructions for that in the digital brochure. Uh, and we also will place a link in the chat function. Uh, so watch for that or look for that as we go through that session for that link in the chat function. So want to kick things off uh, and welcome Jeff from PwC. Jeff has been a great friend in our Social Innovation Summit work. Uh, and Jeff has uh, led many, many social impact initiatives as well as uh, other uh, business focus areas at PwC. So it's a great joy to uh, be speaking with them today. Thank you, Jeff, for, for joining us. Thanks, Mel. Glad to be here. Thanks for hosting and convening this important uh, dialogue. Well, thank you. We appreciate your partnership. Uh, so let's jump into the inequality aspect first. I think it's really on everyone's minds and I don't want to you know, put it at the end when we don't have any time to talk about it. So. It seems like uh, coronavirus is just 
exacerbating inequalities, but more than anything, uh, servicing the inequalities that have existed. So even the word exacerbating, I don't, I don't want to uh, uh, make it seem like they've never existed before. Uh, so those Americans who are better off generally are working virtually, still getting paid, but many individuals in lower socioeconomic classes are really struggling, uh, facing the risk of losing their jobs and going without food, defaulting on loans or rent payments. Can you talk about what you're seeing and hearing just in, in the landscape that, that you're a part of? Yeah, thanks, Mel. I, I, I think this is really an important question, and I'm glad to see it getting so much coverage in the media. The way I think about it is, is I think that COVID is acting as a force multiplier for existing systemic inequalities that exist badly within our society. And while what we're seeing is shocking uh, in terms of those inequalities and, and how they're playing out, it's in some ways not surprising. The, our underserved populations and specifically African Americans, I think is, a, is one of the spotlights right now. We look at Chicago where 50% of the cases are African Americans, 68% of the deaths are African Americans, and yet only 30% of the population are African Americans. That's, that's quite uh, shocking. And I, I actually uh, was talking to our healthcare leader, and we don't know why that's entirely why that's happening. Is there something genetic, um, like sickle cell anemia, as I understand it, that, that makes African Americans more prone to this? Or is it really fundamentally just the underpinning of these, sadly, these people have less access to health care. Um, they might have higher incidence of high blood pressure or diabetes or other factors that are making coronavirus um, affect them much more mortally than they are other um, mm -hmm. <laughs> access to food, access to transportation and health care. All these systemic inequalities that happen um, in some ways, because America has a tendency to cordon off uh, or segregate our, our underserved communities in ways that you don't see playing out in, in other communities. So I think it's absolutely critical that we continue to look at this and, and look at how the landscape is changing. Food no. countries, for example, that were serving up to 1,200 people uh, two months ago a week are now 7,000 a day. Um, yeah. It's quite shocking. Yeah, there's uh, there's long lines, uh, long lines of cars for food banks and everything. So it's uh, it's it's definitely top of mind. Uh, I'll ask you a two part question because I think they're interrelated. Uh, first part: What can businesses do? Uh, you are uh, you are thinking about business services. You have uh, you know insight into a lot of businesses across the country. What do you think they can do right now? But secondly. Uh, how do we prevent this in terms of sliding back into some of these inequalities after uh, the pandemic declines, but not even sliding back to the inequalities, sort of just addressing them or making sure they still stay top of mind rather than people thinking, oh, pandemic is over. Let's move on with our lives. Let's forget about some of these things that we saw. Yeah, great question. I, I think you, in your tee up, you, you spoke to this a little bit, it, you know, putting purpose first. Uh, and putting people first in terms of how we think about our business operations and our responsibility in this moment. I think job number one is to keep our people at work uh, because what we don't want to do is come to this last resort where we have to lay people off and that adds to the burden of unemployment in America and, and the system um, that really is struggling to keep up with all the need right now. So I think job number one for any business that can is keep their people at work and find ways to keep them um, productive, both for clients, but also look for learning opportunities. Are there time to reskill your workforce in a way that you might not have had an opportunity to do so elsewhere? Towards that end, we've launched our digital fitness app, which we've worked along with educators. We have a $320 million commitment to youth education called Access Your Potential which has really helped us um, and prepared us in some ways well to deal with some of the education issues that have propped up parents who are serving double duty. We have a, a number of uh, tools online and curriculum that, to help uh, across a wide range of issues, help with learning. 
They weren't designed for this, uh, for this situation, obviously, but they've proved been useful. Moving from uh, in-person volunteering to virtual volunteering, and we've been experimenting with that for a couple of years, and that's um, prepared as well. But I think job number one, keep your people at work. And our, our chairman, Tim Ryan, said that early and wrote a LinkedIn article, essentially said, now's not the time to be thinking about the bottom line. And that's a, a little bit shocking coming from, you know, a tried and true capitalists like uh, uh, PwC. But I think it's absolutely true and absolutely critical that we think about not short-termism, but long-termism, because we want to prepare our company and our workforce to come out the other side as stronger, stronger um, mm -hmm. from this and use this opportunity, um, which no, none of us would have wished for, but use it as productively as possible. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I think you employ something like 57,000 people. Uh, many of them who, many, they've all been thrown into a new routine on many fronts, uh, becoming educators at home, obviously online meetings, et cetera, but also just working with a lot of clients that are going through a lot of uh, troubling issues or decisions right now or tough decisions right now. What are you hearing from your, your employees? Well, I think the, the first thing is, is people want to help and they, they, they want to do something. There's this desire to be part of the solution. And so we've spun up a lot of different activities around being part of the solution. Our chairman uh, announced he's going to go uh, and do a blood drive and there's a real need in America for blood and there's some real safe ways to do that. And we've, we've been supportive of that. We've been supportive of a number of other activities that uh, <clears throat> um, happened. Our foundation gave $2.85 million to direct relief and feeding America to help wow. the frontline workers and help support the system. But I think the first thing we have to step back is, is realize that this is a systemic problem, but is having very real effects on individuals. And I think we, we have to kind of start with empathy because when this all started, I'm, I'm a parent, my wife and I have a seven year old son and it was quite difficult for us in the first weeks to figure out childcare and balance of this. And I, in fact, have my office door locked and then the door to my bedroom locked as well. So my seven year old son won't barge in here and interrupt us. Um, but, and, and that was easy to feel kind of like, woe is me, right? You know, as, but I think now we're starting to see single people living in, in large urban areas that are living in and can't get to the office they're, they're suffering from profound loneliness. People who are um, going through and, and had their life plans, I'm gonna go to college in the fall, or I'm gonna do this um, here or that there. Like this is interrupted across a wide variety of things. And, and I think most of the people on this webinar are, are, are likely to be on the lucky side of this. Um, not all of us, but many of us are privileged and, and have um, support systems around us to help us through this, um, but it still has an individual impact no matter where you sit and no matter how this affects you. And I think we start with empathy to try to understand the effect and how people are dealing with this. Uh, and then think about how we can help battle that. So for example, much more video calls. And I think this is true across corporate America. Like it used to be that you'd join a video call and like three people would be on video and everybody else would be on the phone. Mm. Now it's quite the opposite. You're the outlier not to be on video. Um, in fact, I, tonight at 7 p.m., I have a virtual happy hour uh, with a number of my colleagues and I will be mixing up uh, margaritas on my side and we'll see what the others are doing on their side. But trying to create human connections during this and, and keep it as, to help us to keep as, as upbeat and positive and, and realize some days, and I, I'll say this to my team, like I'm having a bad day emotionally and trying to deal with this. and and being right. open and honest about that to, to help each other get through this. Yeah, that, uh, we're getting a lot of comments in terms of your, your phrase of uh, starting with empathy. I think that's uh, important to consider and uh, these new routines. Uh, so thank you for all of your thoughts and insight. Uh, really appreciate you joining us today. Uh, we'd love to talk to you more. We'll definitely see you at the Social Innovation Summit uh, and uh, Thank you so much for your friendship throughout all of this and hopefully Thanks, you and your family stay safe and healthy and other loved ones. So uh, thank you so much, Jeff. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, so now we're going to bring in a, a conversation between Mike Masterman and Rabbi Michael Lezak from Glide. 
so Mike has been a great friend of the Social Innovation Summit. Uh, he is always super energetic and uh, he's always working on great initiatives that are interesting. Uh, and then Glide, I know from my days in San Francisco, uh, a really, really, really uh, strong community-based organization, uh, not only uh, the going to services, but just the, uh, the, the, um, the resources that it provides to the community. It was always a beacon in the community and just a North Star for what people uh, can support and get involved with the community. So I want to welcome them. I'm going to turn things over to Mike. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, Mel, and thanks to everyone in the Social Innovation Summit community, sending out well wishes to everybody. Um, it's an absolute honor to, to be here with, with Rabbi Michael. Um, Thank you. Maybe I'll just uh, spend a minute just talking about what Lyft is doing in the community, and then we'll, we'll start our conversation. Um, so for us at Lyft, um, we obviously see uh, the ability for us to fill various transportation gaps that are exacerbated during this time. So we've activated uh, 500 different partners from local communities to nonprofits, to schools and, and governments um, to help provide rides for, for caretakers, for people to the grocery store, for people to get to pharmacies. But we've also activated a new delivery system, um, which will, is helping us to deliver lunches to, um, to homebound seniors and to students who are at home and, and piloting that here, uh, here in the Bay Area and looking to scale that across the country and, and activating different partners like MasterCard who are helping us to fund various initiatives um, and expanding uh, current partnerships that we have with those uh, United Way, who has a two-on-one program, um, and now really diverting a lot of their resources to helping with the COVID response. So um, really, um, really happy to do what we can and play our part um, with our, our, our Lift Up initiative. Um, Rabbi, uh, again, it's an honor to, to be here with you, and I wanna just kick it off um, with you maybe explaining what Glide is and how you ended up at Glide. Absolutely. Uh, I'm Michael Lezak. I'm a rabbi. I work at Glide. It is a giant social justice and social service agency connected to an amazing church uh, in the Tenderloins neighborhood of San Francisco. Uh, we have 50 plus programs from before the pandemic. We were feeding 2,200 meals a day and giving out a million and a half clean needles a year. We help men unlearn violence. We have an alternative to incarceration program. Uh, we have a women's center and just try to show up for people on the deepest margins as we have been doing for 60, 70 plus years. Um, I ended up at Glide uh, about close to three years ago. I had been a congregational rabbi for uh, 18 years. I loved congregational life, always had a heart for justice. About nine years ago, I was reading the new Jim Crow while taking the ferry past San Quentin in Marin and ended up inside San Quentin and realized that the racial makeup Inside San Quentin is almost the inverse of what it is outside. Marin is 80% Caucasian. San Quentin, 60 plus percent men of color. Uh, built out systems to bring my congregants into jails and prisons around the Bay Area. And then had this fortunate chance to join Glide's Center for Social Justice three years ago. Uh, and landed without a job description and have been given some things and been able to create a lot of amazing things. And I, as, oh, as always, feel radically blessed to be a part of such uh, a justice juggernaut and force of good and love in the universe. Um, thank you for that, Rabbi. And we're glad that you are a force of good in the universe thank for you. us. Um, there was a recent article in the New York Times about a uh, homeless shelter and the effects of COVID on the homeless population and, and also on other vulnerable populations. So wondering to get your perspective on that. Yeah. Um, look, uh, Brian Stevenson, who I'll talk about a little bit later, who runs the Equal Justice Initiative in, in Alabama, uh, said that slavery didn't end in 1865. Uh, it just took on new forms. And if you look at just the racial makeup of San Francisco, that is African-American population is down to three to 5%, but 35 plus percent of homeless folks are African-American. It's just a new, I would say a new form of slavery in 2020. Um, of course, people on the front lines in front of Glide when I'm standing serving meals, I'm there a couple days a week. Uh, we see a bro bro much broader representation, representation of folks of color. Me, my privileged white Jewish self, show up in an N95 mask and gloves and, and protected, and most of the folks in line are do not have rain gear, are, are not set. Uh, we at Glider have been trying to show up to get people into hotel rooms, uh, which is happening much more slowly than we think it should. We're, we've per helped purchase over a thousand tents for folks. It is decimating populations, and I feel like the tsunami has not even crested yet. Uh, we're just a month-ish into this and we see the, the 
number of, of unemployed folks, uh, those numbers rising, and we know that's just gonna show up on our doorstep in front of Glide soon. So um, amongst that, I just need to say um, the humanity of people and the gratitude when we are serving meals. Of course, there are people of all different uh, mental health challenges showing up, but people who, who will show up and look us in the eye and say, thank you and God bless this organization. I, and, and a sense of love and compassion in the Tenderloin that I often don't experience in other parts of San Francisco. It really, people judge that neighborhood and are, too many people are afraid of it. I, I say, I feel most welcome in that neighborhood than I do anywhere else in San Francisco. You talk, you talk about the humanity. Do, do you think that, I guess, two, sort of two questions. One, do you think that during this time, it's bringing out the best in, in, in some folks? Because there is a notion that we aren't necessarily coming together as, as well as we, we could be. Yeah. Uh, and the second is that, you know, how your local organization on the front lines, how are you collaborating with the city and other city officials on this? Yeah. Um, our Center for Social Justice, where I work, is in deep conversations with people in the mayor's office and in the governor's office to try to think about short, medium, and long-term programming and how we can partner with one another. Um, and that brings, brings me hope. Uh, of course, there are frustrations. Um, I would say I see a radical growth in the number of people reaching out to me from existing funders and foundations to people who I've not even heard of who want to be a part of the solution. And I think uh, maybe a blessing underneath all of this is that we're, re we're realizing we really are all in this together. And me as trying to help get homeless folks into hotel rooms is not only an ethical and moral thing to do, as I knew beforehand, their well-being is tied up with mine, right? The, the, the Talmud, a, ancient book of Jewish teachings calls those people my brother and my sister, right? I used to talk about that metaphorically. Literally, their well-being is tied up with mine. If, the, if they go down, then there's a better chance that I'm going to go down. And we understand that more as a society now. And I think the invitation is there for us to pull a periscope up and out and above this pandemic to say, how might we pivot out of this? How might we harness the moral outrage of this, see the interconnectivity of, of all of us, and think about the power Think about the power on this call. Think about the power that we all have and summon us to moral responsibility so that we come out of this um, with more hope, uh, with a greater vision of an, an American promised land where, where all folks have access uh, to, to stuff. I want to I want to ask you about um, your recent trip to Alabama. But before that, there is a question from um, from the audience, which is, how do you make these issues a, a real permanent part of our social purpose agenda going forward, instead of it feeling like maybe like a fleeting moment? Yeah, uh, Brian Stevenson, who I would, is like my justice boyfriend, a full justice crush, who runs the Equal Justice Initiative. I quote him regularly, and I think the the four points of his TED talk are applied to all places of. Uh, of challenge, he talks about the power of proximity, that we have to get close. I can sit on a hill in Marin County and talk about homeless people, but there's a difference in getting on the ground in the Tenderloin. Two, we have to tell new narratives. Us versus them, Jew, Christian, white, black, those haven't helped us. How do we dream up new narratives? Three, he said, you have to hold on to hope. I have to believe I can turn Ellis Street. I have to believe I can, I can turn San Francisco. And the fourth one, which is hard for us, is that we have to do uncomfortable things. Right? I have to get close to a person who slept outside for the last month who has, really smells and might have more mental challenges than me. I think once we operationalize those in our families, in our individual souls, in our companies, and see that we're all in this together, I think that is a way to actualize hope and to push forward. There was another question there that I'm forgetting. Agreed. No, I think that's right. I, I was going to pivot to the notion of social justice, and I'm sorry I wasn't able to join you Next year, in Alabama this year, I will. Next year, I'll, I'll be there with you. But can you just give a little context uh, around the trip? And then I want to ask you a specific question around criminal justice reform during this time. Absolutely. Um, uh, I brought Brian Stevenson to speak to my congregation about eight years ago in Marin. He talked then that he was going to open up this museum that connects the dots from slavery to mass incarceration. It's called the Legacy Museum. And there's a memorial, a, a 15 minute walk away called the National Memorial for Peace and Justice that remembers 4,500 known African-American victims of lynching. Um, we brought 100 uh, people from Glide in my wife's congregation, the kitchen to the opening of the museum. We brought uh, another 110 people last year and, and we just returned. We were literally there March 1st through 5th of this year uh, when the pandemic was kind of exploding. 
And I believe that until we look head on at the, is the worst issues happening in America, that we cannot heal them. And I think sometimes we have to go far away and coalesce a group and help them fall in love with one another. The leader of the Glide Ensemble comes and sings with us. Uh, the, the rabbi from the kitchen who was in charge of music, Rabbi Jessica Kate Myers sings with us. We have to open each other's souls. We have to be vulnerable. We have to fall in love with one another and look at the worst stories, right? EJI's, the, the museum is housed in a former slave warehouse. Just hold those words for a minute. It's a hundred yards from the Alabama river where slaves were brought in and another hundred yards uh, away uh, up the block from the town square where slaves were sold, right? It, and Jewish law talks about this notion of teshuva, of making amends. Like if I'm a big jerk to Mike Mosserman, I can't, we can't reclaim our, our juice until I apologize. And we have not even begun to talk about slavery in America. And I, don't, I think the wounds of what we're seeing, you know, the museum connects the dots from slavery to mass incarceration. I would push it, to, it's to mass poverty as well, right? We have built system, we have not built systems that take care of people on the margins, right? In 1965, James Baldwin came to San Francisco and he said, there was no moral distance between life on the ground in Alabama and life on the ground in San Francisco. And we like to think we're super enlightened down here and we're cool, right? But if we look at the, the, the faces in front of Glide, right? And you see the racial makeup of that, we realize that we have not even begun to talk about it. And I think in terms of criminal justice reform and the work that, that needs to be done, the invitation is there for us to really pivot right now. Do, do you think there is this moment right now? Um, there's conversations around decarceration and, yeah. and, and, and you know, there was, a, a, there was momentum around the criminal justice reform movement before this pandemic, but in the wake of this pandemic, do you think we have a renewed moment in time the, to push forward a new narrative um, around this issue? A thousand percent. Um, you know, again, going back to Brian Stevenson, he said, uh, we are more, m more than the worst thing we have ever done. Uh, and, and I think we all make mistakes of different sizes and, and, and this opportunity, of course, we're thinking about our brothers and sisters who are incarcerated, who can, do not have the privilege of us here in our, in our Priuses or in our apartments to social distance, who are getting, who are much more brown, more brown and black, who are getting this disease much more likely than any of us probably on this call. And I feel like when we can see that, um, the deep relationship and that we really are all in this together. My hope and prayer is that, you know, that we can pivot like legally, uh, morally, uh, ethically to think about how we might make space uh, for people to heal from pain. At Glide, we talk about trauma-informed systems, right? We wanna think about the trauma that that person who's waiting in line to get a free meal went through last night, last week, and 20 years ago. And until we understand that trauma and love them and help them heal from that trauma, then they can't heal. And I think societally we can't heal. And I feel like this pandemic is extending us a hand, an invitation to say, now's your time. Now's your time. Are, are, are we going to do this? And I feel like Glide and organizations like Glide, and I want to extend invitations to all of you who I cannot see out there to say, like, who, what is the Glide in your town? And, and how might we dream prophetic dreams? How might we actualize an American promised land that every person who resides on this land deserves to live in with rights to healthcare and education and shelter and food. Amen. One, one last question before we get to the next, uh, the next panel. Um, you know, we're, we're amidst Passover, we're just celebrating Easter. You are a person of faith and someone who in the community brings other faith leaders together. Um, you know, there's a lot of discussion around mental health issues that are coming out of this pandemic. How, how, what is your reflection, putting that hat on, what is your reflection for society, for humanity, uh, you know, as we, as we go through this together? Yeah. Look, I think uh, society was already fragile. Like we were already like skating on thin ice and people, so many people in marginal places. Um, I can just say, I'm, I'm usually in a pretty stable mental, mental health place. I know how this has frayed me and brought challenges into my very privileged family. And I see it on the front lines at Glide with folks who are commuting from an hour or two hours away on a reduced BART schedule, who are getting paid much less than I'm getting paid. And who are, and I know Glide frontline members who would rather be at Glide instead of being at home because they might not be safe because of domestic violence. So it's really pushing us. And I feel like uh, we're in a precarious place and people are hurting. And I feel like uh, 
as I've said all along, like the invitation is there, like one to reinforce our systems of, of healthcare, physical and mental healthcare, and to build out systems, spiritual centers, uh, in, to think about the well-being in our own companies and in our families and in our communities. How are we connecting? How are we going outside of our comfort zone to really love people? Like I'm sitting here on my street. I've got to know people on my street that I did not know before, right? How might we do that in real ways and try to be as real as possible with one another and to say like, I'm going to show up with love, right? I'm going to show up with love. Well, I love it. And I love being able to spend time with you, Rabbi. Amen. Thank uh, you. And just a, a shout out to Glide and the amazing work that that you and your team are doing and being on the front line. So right very much appreciate, appreciate your time. And um, Mel, I'm kicking it back over to you and the group. And again, sending well wishes to everyone in the Social Innovation Summit and broader Amen. community. Send in love. Thank you. Thank you to both of you. I know, uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, Glide is such an anchor in the community uh, and it's so needed and does such tremendous work. I know it's a well-respected service organization and a lot of people are getting are involved there. And also, uh, Mike, thank you so much. Uh, I know you are a, a great social impact leader and we always appreciate your work. Uh, so thank you, both of you, for a, a, an amazing, inspiring conversation. Uh, now I know we're bringing in our next panel. Uh, so I just wanna say hello to Jamal, Emily, and Amanda. Uh, I'll say a couple of quick things about, about this panel uh, first. Um, Emily, uh, thank you jo for joining us from Facebook. I know from a tech perspective, uh, there are so many things that you're, you're thinking about right now, especially with a social impact lens. Uh, Jamal uh, has been a great Social Innovation Summit friend for uh, many years and knows healthcare systems really well. Uh, and so we're happy to have his voice to talk about that perspective, uh, especially in this pandemic. And then Amanda, Again, also an SIS friend for many years, uh, especially with all of our events that we, we uh, produce out in Los Angeles. Uh, she's always fascinating to hear about what is going on in the city and with the mayor, particularly now around some of the things that the mayor is, is leading and your office is leading around innovation. So thank you to all of you for joining us. Really appreciate it. Um, would love to start off by just asking uh, broadly uh, given that there are so many pandemic areas that need support and attention, uh, there's just a long list of, of, of needs out there right now. How did you each focus your response and prioritize your objectives in your own way? Uh, Amanda, would love to start with you at the, the city level and just everything that's going on with the mayor. Um, sure. Well, first of all, thank you, Mel, and thank you to the whole team for having me here and to the previous panelists. Um, just really inspired by by everybody's remarks, um, particularly in this in this time. Um, you know, here in Los Angeles, we are a city of four million people. Um, our county is ten, almost eleven million people. Um, and so, one of the things that for us has become really important um, immediately is how do we partner with our county and all of the neighboring cities? Because one thing we all know about COVID is that its boundaries are porous and it doesn't care if we're from the city of Los Angeles or the city of uh, Ventura. So it's been really important that I'm in a priority for our mayor that, that, we, that we do that. Um, you know, the other, I think, pretty important thing is just looking at the ways that the city can serve. Um, we, you know, in, in your regular life, um, we control and operate and manage everything from rec centers to um, sanitation to uh, parks and recreation. And so really when you think about it, one of the things I always talk about is it, the city is sort of this unseen hero um, on a normal day in life. And now at, in a time of COVID, um, how we adapt all those things and properties and, and systems and processes that we uh, operate, how we adapt that to um, the life that we're leading now, hopefully pretty temporarily, um, but how do we make it serve an even higher capacity um, and at the same time be sure that our workers and our residents are safe. Um, and so, um, you know, our mayor, I work on the mayor's um, executive team as his chief innovation officer, and one of the things that we've, we've think done a really good job of is focusing on, on the data, um, but then also looking at every system that we have in place and finding a way to step it up. Um, and make it something that can help our residents in a more meaningful way. And so there's a long list of innovations. I think we've, we've put in place everything from senior um, food programs to um, 
you know, repurposing, I think one of the more impressive things we've done is repurposing our recreation centers um, as temporary housing shelters um, and find ways to, to help our homeless community um, find, find a bed, um, find a location um, mm -hmm. and be there so that they can be safe off the streets in a time when, when things are, are pretty tough. But, it, yeah. but long list of things, but I would just share those two to get started. Yeah, thank you, uh, Amanda. Uh, Emily, I know, again, from a tech platform perspective, there's probably a long list of things and, and approaches and ways to uh, respond. Uh, how have you narrowed things down to the specific focus areas and, and objectives that, that you're working on right now? Well, we've looked at two things. First, um, what do our partners tell us? We work with both global health organizations, um, national and global nonprofits, and then also with our local partners. Um, we've been working with the mayor's office in LA and we're working with partners across the world to help understand what their needs are and how we can be most helpful. And that's actually why we've been working on um, getting people accurate information for months now. We started to do this in January when we heard from our partners across the world that um, this was coming and that we needed to make sure that people could understand what was happening um, with the virus globally, but also what it may, meant to them personally. And so we've launched the COVID-19 Information Center um, where you can go and find statistics, news, and also tips for navigating daily life during COVID-19. Um, we're also working on uh, misinformation, which we've been doing for months to make sure that we're taking down um, hoaxes and misinformation that could hurt people based on um, validated experts' advice um, and their guidance. And then we also look to what our community needs from us. You know, we look at what people are doing on the platform that we can make easier and more effective for them. Um, and we've seen people connecting with one another um, at higher rates than ever before, really reaching out to connect with friends and family and with their mm -hmm. communities. Um, we've seen people using live video in whole new ways. Um, many churches are going live and people are celebrating um, their faith and coming together as communities now in ways that they haven't before. And just because they're apart physically doesn't mean they have to be apart from their community completely. Um, we've also launched a new messenger desktop application because people are um, reaching out and connecting from home with their friends and family like never before. And then we built a bunch of products to help people um, give back to their communities. So we've launched um, community help, which you can find at facebook.com slash COVID support. And that's where anybody can go and offer or request help from their community with basic needs, things like volunteering, um, supplies, even support for businesses. We've expanded our fundraising tools because we saw people fundraising um, on the platform, particularly to help local businesses who have been dramatically impacted by COVID-19 um, and seeing a lot of people wanting to fundraise for businesses that can then deliver meals to healthcare workers. Um, so we've seen people across the country fundraising for that um, and, and reaching out and helping wow. people in hospitals. And then finally, um, we see a lot of work around groups and people are coming together, whether it's, you know, with your local moms group, mine's super active um, and people are just reaching out to connect and help one another navigate as well as yeah. things like creating new groups to help understand the stimulus. So really partners wow. and our community tell us what to focus on. That is a strong list from what you're hearing in, in the communities and uh, uh, even uh, prioritizing it down to a few things. That's still a, a good, strong list. Uh, Jamal, I want to bring you into the conversation. Uh, obviously, on the healthcare front, your priorities are probably 5x, 10x uh, over everyone else's uh, and things that you need to be focused on right now. But maybe you could just speak to some of the things that you're, uh, you're working on, but just more importantly, like how have you focused in on the most important uh, areas and priorities right now? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Mel. And thanks to the other panelists and a special recognition to all the attendees who are directly or indirectly both, you know, from a health perspective um, and from a professional perspective by this coronavirus. Um, our hearts definitely go out to all of you. Um, we are in a unique position as Common Spirit Health. You know, we're a nonprofit health system across 21 states. So we're uniquely positioned in richly diverse areas from, you know, California, Nevada, to Nebraska, um, Iowa, um, the North, uh, North Pacific Northwest. So we have a broad representation of markets that we are responding to. Um, we have about 137 hospitals across the country, over 1,200 care sites 
And we also employ over 150,000 uh, employees with about 25,000 physicians and uh, advanced practice clinicians. So that gives you a sense as one of the largest hospital systems in the country of um, the national footprint and responsibility that comes with that and how we um, res are responding in the right way to, uh, to this um, a coronavirus. Um, so our, our mission, which frames how we are responding, and I have some examples to share with you, um, is that we make the healing presence of God known uh, in our world by improving the health of people we serve, especially those who are vulnerable, uh, while we advance social justice for all. So we strongly believe that inherent to that mission, that accountability for diversity, inclusion, equity, and belonging at the highest levels of our organization mm -hmm. frames the reality now that we're seeing uh, more than ever, that health equity, achieving health equity is not optional. Um, for, for far too long, many of the inequi inequities and disparities that are being magnified and amplified in this moment, they've always been there. Um, but the reality um, now is that um, we're seeing real time how inextricably linked we all are, no matter how rich you may be, no matter how poor you may be, and our health, mental health, and well being is interconnected. And the reality of that, when we think about what achieving health equity represents, um, is that we have to acknowledge you know, the role that, from a structural, institutional, and systemic standpoint, um, the role that racism has played in creating a situation that even as we all may be vulnerable at any given time, when we think specifically about African Americans and Latinos and the disproportionate impact that we're seeing around morbidity and mortality across our country, um, we have to embrace that reality that we have to have a long-term commitment um, about how do we build an infrastructure um, from top to bottom that is not just about health and medicine, that fosters equity so that when a pandemic or crisis like this hits, um, that we're not surprised, you know, when a light is shining on such inequities that have already been there. Now, with regard to our response to um, the uh, most vulnerable in the midst of COVID-19 of this pandemic, um, we have taken some very have taken some very strong steps as an organization to set some things in motion. So when we think about testing and treatment programs to benefit anyone or all people that present at our facilities or even need virtual services, um, we have implemented a no cost, no question, um, without regard um, of your insurance kind of policy. Um, so whatever you need in this moment, when people present to us, we have eliminated those fiscal barriers, barriers often contributed to many of the inequities that we have seen. Uh, we've also, as I mentioned, suspended charges for all COVID-19 related tests and treatment. And we're also kind of challenging and, and encouraging other health systems and insurance providers to do the same. Uh, you may have heard re recently uh, about in partnership with the state of California that we as Common Spirit Health through Dignity Health um, we stood up uh, the Los Angeles Surge Hospital to address surge capacity, particularly for underserved and minority communities down in wow, Southern that's California. That's great. We've done the same in San Francisco as well um, with St. Francis, one of our facilities. Uh, there you may have heard yesterday um, during the White House press conference an announcement about the dynamic ventilator reserve. Um, and uh, Common Spirit has designated 500 ventilators uh, to that particular program. And the intent of that is for several hospital systems to come together in a shared way to respond to the medical supplies needs around ventilators across this country. And there's a database that is managing the distribution and, and dissemination of uh, supplies like um, uh, the ventilator program. Wow. So that as well. We've also taken steps in Southern California, and these are just one of many examples that could yeah, be these are great. Um, to, uh, to address issues around, you know, homelessness, you know, people yeah. who are housed and who are without food. Um, we've taken steps to implement programs, fiscal supports, and actual services with organizations like the United yeah. Way, Every Table and others to respond in yeah. this moment. So those are some examples. Thank you. And no problem. Thank you, Jamal. I, I would love to pull in Amanda again. Uh, just to speak to uh, maybe a couple of things that Jamal mentioned, but more importantly, just the inequalities and disparities that you're seeing in your response. But generally, 
I mean, look, you're the chief innovation <laughs> officer of uh, the second largest city in the U.S., I think. Uh, you're, you're, you see these inequalities and disparities uh, all the time in your role, but yeah. how have you approached them under this new response, uh, uh, this response uh, environment, I guess? Yeah, I, everything Jamal said, um, I would just say ditto um, in terms of the way that we're seeing COVID play out um, in, in our cities, in Los Angeles, but in cities across the, the country. Um, I think a couple of things that, that just to, there's probably so many different things I could say, but, um, but in terms of sort of the biggest gaps, um, one is in the space of um, sort of meals. Um, so when we look at meals and people's access to food and access to healthy food, um, what we have learned in this, what we've known before and what we're seeing you know, now in this crisis is that um, people of certain age groups have, are, are more challenged to get food simply because they're not mobile. Um, services that we're providing for them before are not mobile anymore. Um, and so that tends to be your elderly group um, mm -hmm. or people who are perhaps impacted the most by COVID um, when it comes to our age groups. Um, so that's something that we've mobilized what we're calling a senior meals program. Um, this is, you know, hopefully will be partially covered by federal dollars, but um, also as a partnership with the state and then in a large part um, done, you know, by the city itself because our seniors here need support. Um, a second thing is around testing. Um, this in the last week in particular has been in the news. Um, one of the things we know is that in certain communities, um, certain groups are being impacted more by COVID. Um, but we don't know for sure because we're also not testing in all of the communities we think we need to be testing in. Um, so here in Los Angeles, we as a city felt pretty, um, felt that we could do, uh, we could add to the testing space. And so we've now stood up 30 individual testing sites um, in under a month's time. Um, and we're doing swab testing, but we're doing testing um, in 30 different locations across the city. Um, and we've emphasized in the neighborhoods where we know um, that we want to have people to have access to testing um, in a much easier kind of way. Um, and the outcome of that is that um, as the county, although, and I, and I should note that the city doesn't have control over public health, and we don't have a public health department. So I am actually in some sense acting as the public health data research person. Um, that's become my role in this crisis. Um, and partnerships with our county, partnerships with um, sort of all the different medical providers that are helping us in, in this way. But, um, but the outcome of the testing piece is that our county will have better and better data about who is mo most impacted here in the city. And as the person that reviews the data um, and reviews all the content we've been getting from Facebook, by the way, thank you. Um, you know, one of the things we know is we have to do a better job um, all over the country. We have to do a better job of understanding who needs tests, who needs access to tests, who's getting sicker, um, who's dying more quickly because they don't have access to resources. Um, and then the last no. group I would say is, um, you know, that I've mentioned seniors, I've mentioned um, sort of the testing problem and the care problem, um, but then, oh, sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I just got a reminder on my on my computer that was very loud, um, oh, causing me to jump. But you know, I, I think it's just information is sort of the the last part. And our mayor has been doing daily briefings here in LA to be sure that um, every single thing that the city and the county is doing, um, that that word is getting out, um, and it's on network television, which I think is very important, particularly for certain groups of people. Um, we've mm. got it on radio, we've got it on Facebook, we've got it anywhere you could get information. And it's the kind of thing you probably wish to see on in back in normal life, um, but particularly now in an emergency, yeah. um, I think getting information out has been really important. And a lot, I think we've seen Absolutely. local leaders um, step up to the helm and I wanna acknowledge that governors and mayors um, have been major heroes um, in all yeah. of this work because they're, they're getting the word out. Yeah, definitely. Emily, uh, I want to transition a little bit here to public-private partnerships. Uh, that's a, a pillar for the Social Innovation Summit, bringing people together, convening so that people meet and build partnerships. Uh, what have you seen in terms of your work around public-private partnerships? Obviously, Amanda just mentioned that that is going into uh, the city to help them. Um, but more specifically, and this is uh, you know from our community uh, asking, when you have many partners around the table, 
uh, how do you keep them engaged long term when they each have their own messaging or priorities that they want to get out there? How do you keep uh, partnerships at the table as a leader like Facebook? I think one of the most important things is um, making sure that partners have the right tools to get their messages out. So we try to work with them in two ways. One is um, on shared priorities, not just between us and our partners, but among the par partners. Um, we make sure that we're working closely with them to share their messages and to make sure that we, we can amplify the work that they're doing. Um, what Amanda mentioned is a great example of it. We have a data for good program that works with nonprofit and government organizations to give them um, data to better target their services and make sure that they um, have more data to inform the work that they're doing. And then we also make sure that our partners um, have access to on Facebook tools so that they can use posts and pages, ads, use Instagram effectively um, to get the message out for any messaging that's specific to them and their um, core group of supporters or followers. And so we, we work very closely with them to make sure that they understand how to use the tools mm -hmm. and are really fully supported in doing that. Um, and then, you know, over the long term, it's it's constantly listening to what our partners need and making sure that we're being responsive to that and both the service we're providing to them and that their feedback is really guiding the development of the tools that we're providing, particularly um, around tools like community help that help people give back and help our, our partners get better um, reach and under and reach the people that they're trying to serve. Well, that's great. Jamal, we only have a few more minutes. Would love to leave the last word with you in terms of uh, partnerships. I know you're amassing a community around your work. Uh, so anything you can uh, tell us about your public-private partnerships and what you're learning and what you're seeing out there uh, on your front. Sure. What's uh, important to us now is um, when we think about advocacy and public policy, a big, that, that's important to the extent that, you know, from a federal standpoint, we have to see legislation that really drives the support of what both and Amanda and Emily stated of how we capture data and analytics. Once you have that information by race, ethnicity, and other key indicators, you can't um, only just apply that to how we triage and address the needs of hotspots, which we need to do. But that information for organizations like us um, across the country allows us to inform public policy around where resources are needed, um, to where we can create sustainable, you know, strategies and policies that uh, are sensitive to um, issues around culture and race. And um, without that type of scale mandate from a legislative and advocacy standpoint, um, we're going to continue to have a fragmented model to where a lot of policies in response to issues like this or to mitigate or prevent problems like this, um, it, it's, it won't happen and it will be very Objective. So data analytics by pulling the, the lever of public policy and advocacy is, a, is of extreme importance to us right now. Yeah. Thank you, Jamal. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, thank you to all the speakers throughout the hour. Really appreciate it. All of the attendees out there appreciate you joining us as well. We uh, sincerely hope you are staying safe and healthy uh, and was just really thinking about you from the Social Innovation Summit community. Um, two reminders, one, Social, eight, Social Innovation Summit is coming up on June 2nd and 4th online, so you can go to socinnovation.com to learn more and register. Uh, we also have the networking function that's going to kick off in a few minutes, so please join that for one-to-one -one networking. And uh, again, just want to make sure everyone is staying safe and healthy, and thank you all attendees and thank you speakers for joining us today. So have a great day and great weekend. Goodbye, everybody.